the moment has arrived, and uh, so glad to bring up our next speaker. And I'll highlight the, the accolades that he truly deserves first, and we'll speak from the heart after that before we bring Tom Hartman up. Progressive national and international syndicated talk show host, whose shows are available all over the world, half billion homes worldwide. New York Times bestselling, four times Project Censored award-winning author of 24 books in print in 17 languages and five continents. Leonardo DiCaprio was inspired by Tom's book, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, which still is available in the uh, bookstore this afternoon, amongst others. And he's a man that is touching his people's lives and making a difference as he helps the youth of the world today, too. Tom has spent so much time of his life working with the International Salem Relief Organization. He and his wife, Louise, founded a community for abused children in New Hampshire. <laughs> SalemChildrenVillage.org is the website you can check out at a later time as well. And a school for learning disabled and ADHD kids, HunterSchool.org, as it touches people's lives and the youth of the world, as well as adults too. Stories have been said, and uh, as I've been through the Coptic training of Tom Hartman, and there's a moment in time when Tom steps through the Coptic temple in Detroit where he was almost not let in the door, I was told. And it's in one of his books, The Prophet's Way, too. He touches on it with Master Stanley. And there's a woman that is the, the matriarch of the Coptic Fellowship. That Her name is Grace Felton. She's in her late 90s now, lives in Illinois. And uh, she was saying, do we let him in the door or not? <laughs> what if we didn't leave, let him in the door that day? Think about it. The door opened for him that day. Now he's opening the door to you as he gets and speaks and shares his wisdom as we aim high and reach for our capstone. Camille was talking about climate change and how you know this is an astrological period that has to do with that. And I've been working with with a, a small group of people, uh, Sam Sachs, Lila Connors, um, Matthew Schmidt, um, Earl Katz, uh, George DiCaprio, and Leonardo DiCaprio in putting together some short videos about climate change. And we just rolled out, day before yesterday, the third one in the series. They're all over at greenworldrising.org. And I'm going to start out by playing one of these videos for you so you can see what we're up to. But it also establishes, I think, what the stakes are right now and what we need to be considering and, and how so then the question, and this is kind of the horrors of climate change, and then the question becomes, how do, we, how do we deal with this with a spiritual response, as opposed to a, another Cartesian, another mechanistic, another, you know, or a political response. So uh, this, is, this video, you can find this over greenworldrising.org, um, and it's called Last Hours. There's a paperback book that I wrote that is that has all that has this and all the source material and all the background information that you can find on you know wherever you buy books too. So it's called Last Hours of Humanity. So here's the video. It's nine minutes. We'll watch this, then I'll talk. The argument is over. We are now in an era where humans shape the destiny of our planet. 97% of climate scientists agree that man-made climate change is real and happening right now. Geologists and climatologists are finding that a rapid climate event is happening right before our eyes. Now consider this, unthinkable and terrifying as it may seem, Nearly all life on Earth could go extinct because of man-made climate change. Here's why. It's hard to imagine Earth without life. We take life for granted, but life has not always flourished here. The Earth has experienced dramatic loss of life, or what we call mass extinctions, five times over the course of geologic history. Each one of these events has resulted in the loss of more than half of all life on Earth. 
At the largest and most devastating of all was the Permian mass extinction. Almost all life on Earth disappeared. Uh, yeah, Permian mass extinction is, in essence, just the greatest crisis that uh, life on Earth has, has ever suffered. By the end of the Permian mass extinction, 95% of all life on the planet was dead. And why is this important today? Because today, a sixth extinction is underway, one that will test the survival of not just human civilization, but possibly of the human species itself. And it bears a horrifying resemblance to several previous global warming-driven events, like the Permian mass extinction. I think it is certainly extremely significant that a lot of the main crises of the past associated with global warming, and so with obvious implications for um, the present day. When we think of extinctions, we think of the dinosaur-killing KT mass extinction, which was triggered by a sudden catastrophic collision with a meteorite. But the most deadly force behind all extinctions isn't from outer space. It's from underground, underwater, and under the ice, where trillions of tons of carbon lies in wait in the form of frozen methane. If this methane melts and is released into the atmosphere, it will produce a sudden and massive global warming. During the Permian mass extinction, greenhouse gases were released by volcanic eruptions in an area that is today called the Siberian Traps. These, along with the heat from the lava flow itself, warmed the atmosphere of the Earth by at least six degrees Celsius. That much global warming took a huge toll land, animals, and plants, but far worse, it warmed the oceans enough that methane, frozen deep under the sea, melted and was released into the atmosphere. That enormous release of methane, a powerful greenhouse gas, pretty much doubled the level of global warming and killed off over 95% of all life, both on Earth and in the seas. It's a kind of a scary thought, but Maybe one of the best geological analogs for the kinds of rapid changes in climate and CO2 in the atmosphere that we're going to witness now and for the next few centuries, potentially, is this end Permian time when, um, as you know, that culminated in one of the largest mass extinctions that we know of. And of course, looking at these ancient events, uh, shows us times of global warming and the atmosphere doesn't care whether the carbon dioxide comes from uh, human activity uh, or from a volcano. It, it has the same end effects. The numbers are very similar from some of the giant lava flows in Siberia. The, the amount of carbon dioxide they release is very similar to the, the sort of fossil fuel burning um, carbon dioxide release that we're, we're, we're doing sort of decade after decade today. Today, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about 400 parts per million a level not seen any time in the history of human life on Earth. We are increasing uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere at rates far greater than any of the most rapid events that happened in the deep geological past. Uh, there is no precedent uh, for what we are doing to the atmosphere. It is an uncontrolled experiment. As you warm the environment, that causes the release of more carbon, which is either methane or carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That in turn increases the rate of warming, which releases even more carbon. And you can see how this begins to cause a so-called positive feedback or just uh, uh, an ever-increasing amount of heating. At the end of 2012, the World Bank issued a report warning governments around the world that a five degree temperature increase is likely unless drastic action is taken to curb carbon emissions. And a six degree increase was, according to some scientists, all it took to pass a tipping point during the Permian mass extinction. There's a virtual scientific consensus that six degrees was all it took to initiate the PETM. In both cases, it involved massive releases of methane. We know that in the bottom of the seafloor, uh, large parts of the ocean margins have, have methane in a solid phase. And what happens is, is that uh, uh, when you change the temperature, it, it can dissociate, or you can think of it as melting this, this uh, frozen methane phase. And so the idea is that during some of these events, we have some triggering uh, or initial cause that forces the uh, ocean temperatures to warm, especially in deep parts of the ocean. And then that dissociates or melts this, this 
solid methane phase, which then goes into gas, which can get into the ocean and the atmosphere. Methane is way worse than carbon dioxide. It's inert right now in the soil. It's not affecting anybody in any way. When you warm it, it becomes gas. Then it starts acting immediately as a greenhouse gas. So this is an immediate and very short-term threat to planetary civilization. The risk is so-called runaway greenhouse, which is that the self-correcting mechanism ceases to kick in. Um, and you heat by a little bit, then you release methane. That then causes excess heating. Uh, and you release more methane, and so it goes on. The sea ice is disappearing very fast. It's, it's the biggest, most rapid single change in any aspect of the planet's surface. When the sea ice retreats, as it's been doing, the, the shallow shelf seas uh, warm up, and uh, this warm water extends down to the seabed. The seabed warms up, it releases the methane, and you get plumes of methane coming up, and these have been seen by expeditions that go out to areas like the East Siberian Sea. We're seeing just big areas of massive bubble plumes of methane coming up to the surface, and that's starting to increase the level of methane in the atmosphere. That's the, the, probably the biggest issue that we face. Um, sea level change is a big one, too, a very expensive one to manage, but the methane release from the tundra, once that gets underway, we reach a point where uh, we lose the option of, of having an effective mitigation strategy. Um, we can always abandon the coastlines, but if, if we activate enough of the carbon reservoir in, in the terrestrial um, biosphere, the, that becomes unmanageable. So that, that's a, unfortunately kind of a doomsday scenario that our trajectory is pointed to while it appears we've already passed the tipping point for an ice-free arctic in the summer other tipping points could be centuries generations or just years down the road the big danger about tipping points is that you can only recognize them when it's too late to do anything about it so why should we risk these catastrophic events in the case of climate change our planet's life support system is at stake so it is our obligation to take every precaution to stop it. We must begin to reduce carbon emissions dramatically. Yet at this moment, we're facing a crisis of world leadership. Powerful fossil fuel corporations are fighting to monetize the trillions of tons of carbon they own that's still underground. Every day, we are witness to more climate-related events. The world community Global citizens, governments, leaders, NGOs, and corporations must come together, step forward, and take decisive action. In order to combat this issue, we must create the largest movement in human history, and it could mean our very survival. Let's not wait until we reach more tipping points. This is the most urgent of times and a most urgent message. To learn more and join the movement, go to greenworldrising.org. So that's that's what I did with my summer vacation. <laughs> um, we've got two more. This is this is kind of the bad news one. The, the 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 second one that follows this is called carbon, and it's about how a carbon tax is a, actually a fairly easy solution. Um, the average taxpayer in the United States last year spent five paid taxes that were five hundred and twelve dollars and thirty two cents in taxes that were used as direct subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. You also, if you're the average taxpayer, paid seven dollars twelve cents in taxes that went to subsidize solar, wind, and all other forms of renewables. If we were to simply reduce the fossil fuel subsidy down to seven dollars and twelve cents a year per person then suddenly fossil fuels are more expensive than solar or wind. It's like, just, it's that easy, it's that fast, that, as, as one step. And then the second one um, that just came out day before yesterday, these are all over at greenworldrising.org, um, the second one that just came out is about uh, the new technologies, solar, wind, how they work, what, you know, what's possible. And then we have a fourth one that we're working on right now called Regeneration, which is an aspect of which I, I'd like to talk about now. So the, 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 the question is, what do we do about this? You know, 
I mean, I, carbon tax is not going to happen this week. We've got literally fossil fuel billionaires, um, you know, the Koch brothers, uh, Exxon Mobil, all these are companies throwing hundreds of millions of dollars into our elections right now, uh, virtually owning politicians. And uh, I'm very concerned about the political process. I personally believe that the solution to this is for us to resacralize the world. Uh, we have been viewing the world as, as a dead thing since basically Rene Descartes, or before that. I mean, yeah, to, the, the Cartesian worldview, though, is kind of the, the, the point at which it got nailed down. And, and it's that we view the world as this giant machine. And in fact, we view everything as a giant machine. We're viewing human bodies as giant machines now. Um, it's, it's one of the premises of modern medicine. But the world is not a machine. Our bodies are not machines. There's a fundamental difference between living things and machines. I could take a car apart in my driveway, and at least if it was an old, non-computerized one with a carburetor, <laughs> I could take it apart and put it back together. And I could turn the key on and it would run. If I took a cow apart in my driveway, and no matter how skilled a surgeon I am, or was, or I'm not, but you know, if I were, you can't sew him or her back up and have that cow move. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So there's, there's something fundamentally different between living things and non-living things. And that's, that's a thing of great consequence. And we, we have, if you, look at the, if you look at the history of the world, there, there have been a number of people who have come up against these walls of not understanding, not anticipating what their behavior is going to produce. Um, in the 16 or 1790s, I forget which century it was, um, Captain Cook was sailing around the world. And he ran into this island off the coast of Australia, what we call New Zealand now. Now, New Zealand 2,000 years ago was completely unoccupied by humans. And about 900 years ago, a, uh, maybe a little longer than that now, um, a group of Melanesian explorers in boats had gone to New Zealand. And what they discovered there was 50 different varieties of moa birds, basically all relatives to the ostrich. They weighed as little as 25 pounds, like a giant chicken, and as large as 600 pounds, bigger than an ostrich. And they were all over the island. And New Zealand's a fairly large island. And so these people thought, wow, look at all this food, because they could literally, these birds were not afraid of humans. They could literally walk up to one, break its neck, and you know, feast for the community for a month. And over the course of the next two, three hundred years, they ate all the moa birds. There's one moa bird pile of bones that they found. It's got over 90,000 moa bird skeletons in it. And when they were done eating all the moa birds, then it was like, OK, what do we do now? Then they started fishing. And they overfished the waters around New Zealand to the point we, see, we can see this in the archaeological records. They started out with big hooks, and the hooks got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller. Small and pretty soon, they could, there was no fish left that they could eat. So then they, they, during this time also, they basically ate every other animal on the island. And finally, they were down to rats and lizards and frogs. Mm. And, and they were starving. There was famine going on. And so uh, the Mori, which is in their language means moa eaters. The Maori people of New Zealand, the indigenous people of New Zealand, who had just, again, just shown up there a thousand years ago or more or less. But they were the first humans there. They started, they created 28 communities around the island and created, built these fortresses, they called them paws, and these very elaborate military rituals. And they turned to the last source of protein that they could find, which was eating each other. So these various 
Mori communities would attack each other and they would steal people to eat them. And in fact, when a raiding party would go, because New Zealand's a fairly large island, it can take two, three days to get from one place to another, they would bring along some of the slaves that they had got, got captured uh, you know, with a rope as food on the hoof that they would eat along the way. And to this day, the Maori are quite proud of this heritage. There, you find poetry, you find stories from even from the 17th and 18th centuries about from people who were still cannibals, you know, that they were proud of this warrior tradition, those fierce warriors on the planet. So Captain Cook arrived there, and uh, he had no idea what to expect. He didn't realize these people had this very sophisticated warrior culture. I mean, with rules of war and systems for war that would have made a, a European castle shrink. And he pulls up, and, and his number two guy and three other uh, of his men get in a small boat, and they're going to row up to the shore. And the Mori come out, and they put four or five boats in the water and start furiously paddling out to meet them. And the, they thought, oh, cool, the locals are coming to meet us. <laughs> and the Mori, of course, were going, wow, food! <laughs> <laughs> and so the Mori got this boat with these four guys in it, and they killed three of them immediately. And one of them, uh, they didn't kill him. They took him up on the shore and figured they'd eat him later. And they <coughs> built a big bonfire, and they put the bodies in it, and they stood there and they ate them in sight of Captain Cook, who was watching just totally horrified. He named that place Murderer's Cove and left. Never went back. Murderer's Bay. Still, that's still the name of it. And when he left, he headed toward Hawaii. And about two-thirds of the way there, after a month or so of sailing, he ran across another island that had never been visited by Europeans. And this was, he called it British New Caledonia. Now, British New Caledonia is much smaller than New Zealand. It's, it's more like the size of uh, Maui. And uh, it had been occupied 2,000 years before New Zealand by the same Melanesian explorers, these people from, from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. They'd gotten on a boat and boom, ran into this island and said, ta-da. And sure enough, the archaeological record shows that people got there to New Cap British New Caledonia and they ate all the moa birds, same thing, <laughs> descended into a warrior culture, engaged in cannibalism, and then something changed. And their stories, the indigenous story is that a prophet appeared among them and said, you've got to have a different way of life. This is sort of like uh, Christianity. It's sort of like the Iroquois Confederacy. You know, the stutterer came forward and he said, it's time to stop the wars and live in peace. And it's this not a new thing. And by the time, so when Captain Cook showed up there, they had been living in peace for six, seven hundred. They had, they had developed ways to maintain a stable population. The principal way to maintain a stable population is to put the women in charge. Um, just like, I'm serious, just like with the Iroquois Confederacy, four out of five Iroquois Confederacy nations, the men were not allowed to vote um, because they, you know, they knew what happens when men vote. And, and um, it, was, it was pretty amazing. And Captain Cook wrote in his diary that these were the happiest people he'd ever met, he'd ever seen in his life. This was the para this was a paradise. Now it was still fairly barren because they'd wiped out a lot of the indigenous flora and fauna back in their starvation phase. And uh, he just he just went on and on and on about it because these people had figured out how to live in harmony with their environment. They figured out what the limits of the ecosystem were, and they lived within those limits. The way that nature works is, you know, virtually everything, everything's waste is food for something else. And they, you know, whether it's composting the garden, whatever it is, you know, they figured this out. Every animal, every, everything in nature is this way. Uh, with modern society, we've gone beyond that. We produce waste that is toxic to everything, nuclear waste, for example, chemicals. So, um, the, the reason I share that story with you is because it illustrates what happens when consciousness changes. And, and, you know, probably out of necessity. And as you can see from the information here, we might be very close to a necessity 
there are a number of climate, there's a guy named Guy McPherson who's a climate scientist from Arizona, from Arizona State University, who's running around saying, it's over, you know, we're in hospice, we should start getting along with each other because, you know, in 60, 70 years, there won't be any more humans on the planet. He's dead serious about this. Um, I think he's overly pessimistic. And I've talked to a lot of really good climate scientists. Michael Mann, who is in this movie, is, is a friend, and he's an advisor to us on these things. He's the guy who came up with a hockey stick that Al Gore turned and made famous, you know, with the CO2 level. Mm -hmm. University of Pennsylvania scientist. <laughs> and Michael thinks that we've got 20 years to stop carbon in our atmosphere. That's not much time. But, you know, it's 20 years, so it's a possibility. So. What do we do about this, and 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 how, you know, where where do we where do we go with this? One of one of my favorite lectures back when I was when when John and I were teaching at the Coptic Temple in Detroit after Hammond Bay and Master Stanley died, and. and um, And Louise and I would drive down there on Tuesday nights, and, and you would, and we were, I guess we were taking turns, John, it's been a long time. I, I, um, one of my favorite lectures was talking about this topic, and I never had a graphic before, a visual before, but I've got one now that I think is really cool. Um, and that is, what is consciousness? What is the essential nature of matter? We know that the physical stuff is made out of you know, molecules, which are made out of atoms, which are made out of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which are made out of mesons, which are made out of quarks, which are, you know, until so you get down to photons or something like that. But what's that made of? What are those particles made of? Uh, Albert, Albert Einstein came along and he said, well, those particles are made out of energy. You know, the light that you see this is energy. The sounds you hear, it's energy. And what happened is that through the course of the creation of the universe, the Big Bang or whatever, um, some of that energy is still around as energy, and some of that energy got locked up as matter. And if you could take a piece of matter and disassemble it to the point where it just becomes energy again. What is consciousness? What is the essential nature of matter? We know that the physical stuff is made out of you know, molecules, which are made out of atoms, which are made out of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which are made out of mesons, which are made out of quarks, which are you know, until so you get down to photons or something like that. But What's that made of? What are those particles made of? Uh, Albert, Albert Einstein came along and he said, well, those particles are made out of energy. You know, the light that you see, this is energy. The sounds you hear, it's energy. And what happened is that through the course of the creation of the universe, the Big Bang or whatever, um, some of that energy is still around as energy, and some of that energy got locked up as matter. And if you could take a piece of matter and disassemble it to the point where it just becomes energy again, sort of like taking an ice cube and putting it on a stove so that it boils away and becomes steam, it changes state, how much energy would be in that piece of matter? How much energy is there in a single atom or in an ice cube? And he came up with a really simple formula. The amount of energy that would be released if you were to take a piece of matter and disassociate it, convert it to energy, 
the amount of energy that will be released is equal to the mass of the matter times a very specific number, 186,000 squared. 186,000 is the speed of light. The formula is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. E equals mc squared. Well, heard it, right? Now you, now you can explain it to your high school kids, right? You were right. So then the question is, what kind of energy is that? You know, what's the, what's the most subtle energy? I mean, this, this light energy is fairly coarse energy. It's fairly low frequency energy. We can, you know, we measure it, we can see it, we can, we get it. And at this level, if you look at all, at the entire universe, and you look at all the light, and you look at all the sound, and you look at all the other forms of x-rays, and there are all these other forms of energy, and all the matter that's out there, it doesn't account for, you know, we're still missing like 70% of the universe. And now they're coming up with dark matter as a way to fill that, but nobody knows what dark matter is. My hypothesis has always been that the most subtle form of energy is love. That that's the stuff that gets slowed down to make light or sound or other forms of energy and that, that they then get slowed down to make atoms and physical matter. That literally everything in the universe is made out of love. And, or something that we would call love or consciousness or cosmic consciousness or, you know, bliss, satchidananda, you know, the, the old Indian saying. And that, and that we, we function like radio or television receivers. You know, if you were to go back 200 years ago, and say to somebody, and if you could get in a time machine and go back 200 years with a, with a radio, and say to somebody, here's this box. Someday, there's going to be voices coming out of this box from other places in the world. They would look at you and say, you're crazy. Right? But <laughs> voices from the other side of the world. And you say, and they're in the air all the time. You just can't see them or hear them. This box extracts them from the air. What? <laughs> they say, and, and after this box, we're going to have a box that has pictures. So you can see people all over the world. Oh, come on. And it's in the air all the time? Yeah, it's in the air all the time. You just have to tune to the right frequency to pull it out. Our brains, our minds, and our bodies, I, I view it as one whole system are like those radio receivers. They're, they, you know, we can, we can tune to the frequency we want. We can tune to the frequency of hate, we can tune to the frequency of fear, we can tune to the frequency of panic, we can tune to the frequency of love. And I'm convinced, both as a very practical force, like a political force, for example, that love is the most powerful. Look at how Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi changed the world with love. Everything that happened to them, their response was, I still love you. Beat me with hoses, you know, spray me with hoses, beat me with sticks, sick the dogs on me, I, I still love you. And Gandhi, I mean, you know, what he went through was insane. And their response was always love. I think this is the most powerful force in the universe. I think it's not only the most powerful force in the universe, I think it's what the universe is made of. I think it's the primordial stuff. I think this is the reason why when people are dying and have near-death experiences or they can come back and tell us what it was like, or they have the enlightenment experience like Ramana Maharshi had after he sat in a cave for 10 years and kept asking himself, who am I, who am I, who am I? And the, the, the earlier, our, our shaman friend, um, yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. Steve, thank you. I, I'm so bad with names. I'm very sorry, Steve. Um, was talking about, you know, asking, going into the observer mode, and that was Ramana Maharshi did. A friend of mine, Michael Hutchison, did the same thing. He was paralyzed. He broke his neck, and he was stuck in this god-awful nursing home in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, he decided to turn it into his monastery. He had no choice. He said, like, I always wanted to go to a monastery and meditate, so I'll just meditate here in this wheelchair. 
And after a year or so, he had this just sudden experience where like everything just became transparent and he was filled with bliss and light just overwhelmed him and he felt connected to absolutely everything and it didn't go away. Michael and I had hours of conversation <coughs> over the years and in fact I had him on my program a few times talking about this. And you can find if you just type but if you Google Michael Hutchison, H-U-T-C-H-I-S-O-N, and my name, you'll find uh, transcripts of our conversations. And Michael was like, this is available to everybody. You don't have to wait until you die to have this consciousness. And, and when you get this, you realize that it's all just a movie. It's all just a movie. <laughs> And you know we jump into it all with all this vim and vigor and, and passion in it, but it's a movie. And we're the ones that it's being played out through. So I'm not talking to you. Spirit is talking using my voice. And I don't mean that in some sort of pontifical, oh, I'm so cool. We all are, right? It's, we're, we're not, everything that's happening is happening through us rather than by us, even though we think it's by us. There's some fascinating research on this where they, they looked at um, brainwaves of people, asked them to make a decision. And by the time the person had made the decision, their brain had already decided, or they had already started to engage in the action, like moving their hand before they realized that they had thought about it. And if you've tried meditating, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's you're sitting, as, as Steve pointed out, you're sitting there meditating, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, why am I scratching my knee? You know, so you didn't even notice that I was doing that. So there's, and, and to, to really kind of make it wild, I'm guessing most of you have, have seen what a brain looks like, the neural networks. It's just this very complex, I'm not talking about the brain with all the convoluted things, but the microscopic brain, right? The, what neural networks look like where you have nerves and then you've got these axions that connect them and then you've got a synapse where they almost touch it. So it's like, you know, you've got these spots that have these lines that connect them, right? And this, and this incredibly complex network and there's constantly energy flowing through this network. And this is the matrix, our brain, that allows us to tune into sound, light, emotions, or enlightenment. Right, or the profound stuff, or love. I mean, we, we touch love. Typically, we, we, organize, we reorganize our brain to touch love through interpersonal relationships. And, but, the, but, you know, if the entire universe is this. So, I wanted to share another, just a short video. This is put together uh, from, uh, I believe, NASA was involved in putting this together. And what they did is they, they put a, 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 a telescope on the sky, an x-ray telescope, they're looking at x-rays, at 1.6% of the sky, which is about what you would see if you took the tip of your thumb and you held it up in a night sky and only looked at the stars the, the tip of your thumb was obscuring. Right? The whole rest of it is being ignored. So this is just a, and, and looked as far back as they could, as far off into the universe as they could number one, so it's 1.6 percent. And number two, there's a difference between a solar system and a galaxy, and just for those of you who may not be familiar with this, we live in a solar system, right? We've got the sun, and then you've got the planets around the sun, these nine planets around the sun. A galaxy is a collection of solar systems. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, has over a billion stars in it, and it's one galaxy. It looks like this giant pinwheel, and we're way off in some far remote edge of the Milky Way. But the Milky Way is one of just billions or trillions of galaxies. So in this video that you're going to watch here, and I'm going to kind of narrate it. In fact, can you, you want to start it? This is, it's called Large Scale Structures of the Universe. The opening image covers 2.4 billion light years. The, the amount of space, it's 1.5% of the total diameter of the universe, the amount of space that light travels, and every point of light is a galaxy, not a sun, but a billion suns. Every point of light, or hundreds of millions. 
And there you go. Doesn't it look like a brain? <laughs> and now we're going to zoom into this until we get down to the level of individual nerve cells functionally. And this is 500 a million light years, 250 million parsecs, actually. Close. Mm. And keep in mind, each, each mm. little dot of light is a galaxy. Wow. Not just mm. us. A billion or a thousand billion stars, 100 billion stars. And as we go deeper in, we also see the fractal nature of the universe. Right? That, that everything, as you get smaller and smaller, it's identical. As you get bigger and bigger, it's identical. It's like if you've ever popped a piece of cauliflower off, the individual piece of cauliflower looks just like the entire head of cauliflower. That's called a fractal. Hmm. Here we are now going down through the galaxies. And you can see these, these tendrils right, of energy that connect hmm. them all together. They're communicating constantly. Just like just like the uh, mm. just like the axions and the synapses and the nerves, and it's almost like you know some of these junction galaxies act like synapses where they branch and stuff branches off. This is the universe. The large scale structures of the universe. And so we'll go all the way down into this one, and then and then they pull back out. And you can see what it looks like again. So the universe is, is constantly expanding. It's constantly becoming more sophisticated. So if it's aware, its awareness is actually increasing in complexity, second by second. What if our consciousness, and I, by consciousness, I don't just mean the ability to know 1 plus 1 equals 2. I'm talking about even the ability to have cosmic consciousness. What if our consciousness, what if we're just the radio receiver and this is the transmitter? Right? This is what we're resonating with. This is what we're tuning into, which is the entire universe. And then when Ramana Maharshi says, <laughs> they say to him, you know, well, what's the big thing you learned? And, and how, how many times, John, did we hear this from Master Stanley in Hammond Bay? It's all one. It's all one thing. So, so anyway, we you can keep that running and just for the heck of it. Um, and it's more fascinating than I am, I think. So, so here's the 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 big challenge is how do we? In fact, here here we're backing out again now. And you can go back, you know, this is now. And keep in mind, this is 1.5%. And it's like looking at a slide from, from a brain, right? You're just looking at a little tiny bit of tissue, basically. Go. Cool. Thank you. Um, so what do we do with this? The, the cat is walking me through this sense after sense after sense to the point where I am just totally connected now to this world that I'm looking at. I can see it, I can hear it, I can feel it. You just feel the wind on your face, feel the, the weight of your butt on the chair. You know, there's gravity, the earth is holding us here. And I'm just completely there. And then he leans across the table like he's going to tell me some incredible secret. And he said, there's something you need to know. What's that? And he says, and as he says this, I'm looking at all this stuff. And he says, it's, and he's whispering, loud stage whispering. He says, it's all alive. And in that moment, I saw that it was all alive. I mean, even the stuff that looks like it's inanimate, it's all vibrating with the fire of life. It's all part of creation. It's all alive. And it washed through me all the way down to my feet. I felt like the, every barrier vanished. 
And you know, I spent the next 15 years trying to recreate that <laughs> experience. You know, that because it was a little enlightenment moment. It was so powerful. I am convinced that I started out talking about Rene Descartes and the Cartesian worldview and how the Cartesian worldview is not served us well. The idea that the universe is a machine, that the world is a machine, that the atmosphere is a machine. If we can just figure out which levers to pull, we can solve all problems. You know. It's not a machine. It's a living thing. The planet is a living thing. And so I, I personally believe that the biggest, and this is going to be part of the focus of the fourth video, which will be out in a couple of weeks. I personally believe that the, uh, the biggest challenge we face, and maybe even the easiest one, is to change people's consciousness about what's real. To, to cause people to wake up to the fact that it's all alive. It's all alive. You're alive, I'm alive, we're here right now in this moment, surrounded by life in a universe that's alive. It's all alive. If it's all alive, how can we continue to throw poison into it? That's crazy. I mean, six, we've had five mass extinctions on this planet. Every single one was, was caused by carbon underground being removed from underground and thrown into the atmosphere. The Permian mass extinction, it was volcanic eruptions. Out of the five, five mass extinctions, four of them were volcano driven, where, where continents were tearing apart, moving around, things like that. And what it did is it heated up the oceans enough that all that methane got bubbled up into the atmosphere, and boom, you had an extinction event, and everything died. And, and everything got rebooted. The one exception to that that wasn't driven by, by uh, volcanoes was the, the one that killed the dinosaurs, which was caused by the asteroid hit. But the asteroid hit stirred up all the methane, right? Same thing. So there's this methane bomb. It's like five billion tons of methane sitting at the bottom of the oceans that if the oceans warm up just one or two degrees, it goes off. And nothing's left for a million years. And we can do something to prevent that from happening. But I think, I really think that you know, running around saying, oh my God, oh my God, we're all going to die, is not the way to do it. I think the way to do it is to point out that it's all alive, that we're part of this. This is, this is what the New Caledonians had figured out that the Moris hadn't figured out. This is what the Iroquois had figured out that the, that the European settlers didn't figure out. In fact, Ben Franklin, when he, he uh, he invited 34 Iroquois elders to come to the Constitutional Convention, bless it, on the opening day, and they stayed there for five days, sleeping in the second floor of, of Independence Hall in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. And, and Franklin gave the opening speech where he introduced them to the delegates. And this was entirely, this language sounds harsh, but it was, it, 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 back in 1787, this was actually considered a flattery. This was praise for the Native Americans. He said, um, it should be, he said, it should be an extraordinary thing if five nations of ignorant savages have been able to forge a bond which has lasted in peace for a thousand years, and 13 colonies of educated Englishmen can't do the same. <laughs> <laughs> and what Abigail Adams knew, John Adams' wife, John Adams was one of the delegates to the convention, what Abigail Adams knew was that four of the five Iroquois nations did not end vote. So she sent a letter to John saying, don't forget the ladies. And John sent her back, you can find all this stuff, it's easily found online and whatnot. Uh, and John sent a letter back to Abigail, she was up in Braintree, Mass, he was in Pittsburgh. He sent a letter back to her saying, uh, count on it, but we will not forget our male prerogative. <laughs> so she's sending back a letter saying, if you don't give women the full rights of men, we, I, I will lead a rebellion. We are, we are determined to foist a rebellion, to foment a rebellion. And he ignored her. And here we are. But anyway, I, I am, I'm part of digression, but I, I, just, I just find the whole thing fascinating that, that human beings repeatedly 
And you find this story with virtually every Aboriginal society, every Native Indigenous society. They hit a wall over and over and over again. The Iroquois did, the, the, the uh, Pueblo people did, the uh, he, he, tribe after tribe. Peter, Peter Farm documented this in a book called Man's Rise of Civilization, the American Indian back in the 60s. And, um, and in fact, this is one of the criticisms is, that's lobbied or that's thrown by right-wingers by and large against people who try to hold up you know, uh, Seneca talking about you know, the importance of preserving the pristine nature. And they say, oh yeah, but the, you know, the, the Indians didn't do that. They wiped out the three-toed sloth because it was easy to kill. They wiped out the, the woolly mammoths. They wiped out the saber-toothed tigers. They wiped it, you know, they killed off all these big animals, um, you know, because they were hungry. And they created extinctions. And sure enough, you know, the Clovis people, 12,000 years ago, they, they wiped out all these animals. And then they hit a wall. And they said, OK, we've got to figure out how to live in a sustainable fashion. We can't do this anymore. And, and the way that they, virtually without exception, all around the world, the way that these Aboriginal societies figured out how to live in balance was by sacralizing the world, by saying it must be that everything around us has a place, everything around us has consciousness, everything around us is part of everything that is, and we're going to be part of everything that's around us. We're going to interact with this in a really good and healthy way. And that's our work, or at least that's part of our work. That's my work. Part of my work is to re-sacralize the world, is to awaken people to the fact that it's all, it's all one, it's all sacred. And, and from that, then everything else, you know, how we treat our kids, how we treat each other, how we do our society, how we deal with criminals, how we deal with, with uh, you know, society's problems, society's problems, how we educate, how we, how we conduct business, how we do our politics, everything else flows out of that. Because when the fundamental question is, what's in the best interest of the seventh generation from now, which is in the Iroquois Confederates, Confederacy's constitution, every decision has to be made in the context of how it's going to affect the seventh generation. When that becomes the, the frame, then decisions are made very differently. So um, I've learned a lot from the Coptics over the years. I'm a, uh, the, the Master Stanley and Hammond Bay uh, changed my life tremendously. And John Davis changed my life tremendously. And I've learned a lot from John and from, from Master Stanley and from Hammond Bay. And, and this is a piece of it in how I'm working to reach my capstone. And, reach for yours. And, and how you can too. So, the, the good news is that this is something that we can do. Um, we absolutely can do. So, on that, thank you very much for showing up. <laughs> minutes, if anybody has a question, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Fukushima. Fukushima, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's my opinion that, and I have not heard this from anyone, et cetera, but I've been anti nuclear for years. But, um, the the uh, I'm wondering if Fukushima is also going to be affecting this uh, uh, yeah down in the 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 uh, I'm wondering if Fukushima is also going to be affecting this uh, uh, yeah down in the bottom of the ocean oh the methane methane, methane yeah methane yeah methane because the currents are bringing the radioactivity up they're venting stuff the heat. And it's not only the radioactivity, it's the heat of right. the stuff that they're doing. Right. Isn't that? It probably won't have any effect on it because the, the radioactive material, we're now measuring off the west coast of the United States, cesium-134 and 137 from Fukushima. The, the radioactive, the, they're called actinides, the transuranic elements. They're showing up here. Yeah. But they're in, they're, they're in a concentration of six becquerels per cubic meter of water, which is you got this much water, and six times a second you hear a click on a guy. That's not much. It's very, very dilute. It's not enough to heat the methane. What it is enough to do is because the body thinks, all bodies, our bodies, fishes' bodies, all bodies, think that cesium is potassium. Cesium is next to potassium on the periodic table. 
our bodies think that cesium is potassium. So, and potassium is the essential ingredient of all of our muscles. So we absorb cesium and it goes into our muscles. And this is why there's this condition around Chernobyl called Chernobyl Heart, where all these uh, young people, old people, all across, they just, the holes are burned in their heart because the heart is the most rapidly growing, constantly renewing muscle in the whole body. And so it takes enormous amounts of potassium. In fact, people with heart disease are typically put on potassium supplements. We're told to eat things that are high in potassium, like coconut juice. And everybody thinks it's bananas. Bananas are actually fairly low in potassium contained compared to a lot of other things. So what happens is that the fish eat the, 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 the plankton absorbs the cesium, thinking it's potassium. Then the little fish eat the plankton. Then the medium-sized fish eat the little fish. And then the big fish eat the little fish, the medium size. And by the time you've got it into a blue fish tuna, you can run a Geiger counter by it and have it go brrrr. It's called bioconcentration. And that's the real uh, danger. That's, I, you know, I've, I have three kids who live in Portland, Oregon, and, I'm, and thank God they're all vegetarians, because you know, <laughs> uh, if, if I was eating fish and I was looking at, you know, the, 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 my first question would be, is this Atlantic or Pacific? Because they are fairly separate bodies of water. And Pacific fish right now, I would not go near personally. It's just, you know, and I don't have, I can't point to any specific science about that. Um, one of the reasons is that our government has stopped monitoring these things in the, in the wake of Fukushima. This is how we responded to it, uh, like that, right? So. The moment has arrived, and uh, so glad to bring up our next speaker. And I'll highlight uh, the accolades that he truly deserves first, and we'll speak from the heart after that before we bring Tom Hartman up. Progressive national and international syndicated talk show host, whose shows are available all over the world, half billion homes worldwide. New York Times best-selling, four times Project Censored award-winning author of 24 books in print in 17 languages and five continents. Leonardo DiCaprio was inspired by Tom's book, The Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight, which still is available in the uh, bookstore this afternoon, amongst others. And he's a man that is touching his people's lives and making a difference as he helps the youth of the world today, too. Tom has spent so much time of his life working with the International Salem Relief Organization. He and his wife, Louise, founded a community for abused children in New Hampshire. <laughs> SalemChildrenVillage.org is the website you can check out at a later time as well. And a school for learning disabled and ADHD kids, HunterSchool.org, as it touches people's lives and the youth of the world, as well as adults too. Stories have been said, and uh, as I've been through the Coptic training of Tom Hartman, and there's a moment in time when Tom steps through the Coptic temple in Detroit where he was almost not let in the door, I was told. And it's in one of his books, The Prophet's Way, too. He touches on it with Master Stanley. And there's a woman that is the, the matriarch of the Coptic Fellowship. That Her name is Grace Felton. She's in her late 90s now, lives in Illinois. And uh, she was saying, do we let him in the door or not? <laughs> what if we didn't leave, let him in the door that day? Think about it. The door opened for him that day. Now he's opening the door to you as he gets and speaks and shares his wisdom as we aim high and reach for our capstone years and kept asking himself, who am I, who am I, who am I? And the, the earlier, our, our shaman friend, um, yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. Steve. Steve, thank you. I, I'm so bad with names. I'm so, very sorry, Steve. Um, was talking about, you know, asking, going into the observer mode, and that was from Ravana Maharshi. She did, a friend of mine, Michael Hutchison, did the same thing. He was paralyzed. He broke his neck, and he was stuck in this god-awful nursing home in, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, he decided to turn it into his monastery. He had no choice. He said, like, I always wanted to go to a monastery and meditate, so I'll just meditate here in this wheelchair. And after a year or so, he had this just sudden experience where, like, everything just became transparent, and he was filled with bliss, and light just overwhelmed him, and he felt connected to absolutely everything. 
and it didn't go away. Michael and I had hours of conversation <laughs> over the years, and in fact, I had him on my program a few times talking about this. And you can find, if you just type, uh, if you Google Michael Hutchison, H-U-T-C-H-I-S-O-N, and my name, you'll find uh, transcripts of our conversations. And Michael was like, this is available to everybody. You don't have to wait until you buy to have this consciousness. And, and when you get this, you realize that it's all just a movie. It's all just a movie. And you know, we jump into it all, with all this vim and vigor and, and passion in it, but it's a movie. And we're the ones that it's being played out through. So I'm not talking to you. Spirit is talking using my voice. And I don't mean that in some sort of pontifical, oh, I'm so cool. We all are, right? It's, we're, we're not, everything that's happening is happening through us rather than by us, even though we think it's by us. There's some fascinating research on this where they, they looked at um, brainwaves of people, asked them to make a decision. And by the time the person had made the decision, their brain had already decided or they had already started to engage in the action, like moving their hand before they realized that they had thought about it. And if you've tried meditating, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's you're sitting, as, as Steve pointed out, you're sitting there meditating, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, why am I scratching my knee? You know, so you didn't even notice that I was doing that. So there's, and, and to, to really kind of make it wild, I'm guessing most of you have, have seen what a brain looks like, the neural networks. It's just this very complex, I'm not talking about the brain with all the convoluted things, but the microscopic brain, right? The, what neural networks look like, where you have nerves, and then you've got these axions that connect them, and then you've got a synapse where they almost touch it. So it's like, you know, you've got these spots that have these lines that connect them, right? And this, and this incredibly complex network, and there's constantly energy flowing through this network. And this is the matrix, our brain, that allows us to tune into sound, light, emotions, or enlightenment, right? or the profound stuff, or love. I mean, we, we touch love. Typically, we, we, organize, we reorganize our brain to touch love through interpersonal relationships. And but, the, but, you know, if the entire universe is this. So I want to share another, just a short video. This is put together uh, from, uh, I believe, NASA was involved in putting this together. And what they did is they, they put a, 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 a telescope on the sky, an x-ray telescope. They're looking at x-rays. At 1.6% of the sky, which is about what you would see if you took the tip of your thumb and you held it up in a night sky and only looked at the stars the, the tip of your thumb was obscuring. Right? The whole rest of it is being ignored. So this is just a, and, and looked as far back as they could, as far off into the universe as they could, number one. So it's 1.6%. And number two, there's a difference between a solar system and a galaxy. And just for those of you who may not be familiar with this, we live in a solar system, right? We've got the sun, and then you've got the planets around the sun, these nine planets around the sun. A galaxy is a collection of solar systems. So our galaxy, the Milky Way, has over a billion stars in it. And it's one galaxy. It looks like this giant pinwheel, and we're way off in some far remote edge of the Milky Way. But the Milky Way is one of just billions or trillions of galaxies. So in this video that you're going to watch here, and I'm going to kind of narrate it. In fact, can you, you want to start it? This is, the, it's called Large Scale Structures of the Universe. The opening image covers 2.4 billion light years. The, the amount of space, it's 1.5% of the total diameter of the universe. The amount of space that light travels, and every point of light is a galaxy, not a sun, but a billion suns. Every point of light, or hundreds of millions. And there you go. Doesn't it look like a brain? <laughs> and now we're going to zoom into this until we get down to the level of individual nerve cells functionally. 
and this is 500 uh, million light years, 250 million parsecs, actually. Close. Mm. And keep in mind, each, each mm. little dot of light is a galaxy. Wow. Not just us. A billion or a thousand billion stars, 100 billion stars. And as we go deeper in, we also see the fractal nature of the universe. Right? That, that everything, as you get smaller and smaller, it's identical. As you get bigger and bigger, it's identical. It's like if you've ever popped a piece of cauliflower off, the individual piece of cauliflower looks just like the entire head of cauliflower. That's called a fractal. Hmm. Here we are now going down through the galaxies. And you can see these, these tendrils right, of energy that connect hmm. them all together. They're communicating constantly. Just like just like the uh, mm. just like the axions and the synapses in the nerves, and it's almost like you know some of these junction galaxies act like synapses where they branch and stuff branches off. This is the universe, the large scale structures of the universe, and so we'll go all the way down into this one, and then and then they pull back out, and you can see what it looks like again. So the universe is, is constantly expanding. It's constantly becoming more sophisticated. So if it's aware, its awareness is actually increasing in complexity, second by second. What if our consciousness, and I, by consciousness, I don't just mean the ability to know 1 plus 1 equals 2. I'm talking about even the ability to have cosmic consciousness. What if our consciousness, what if we're just the radio receiver and this is the transmitter? Right? This is what we're resonating with. This is what we're tuning into. Just the entire universe. And then when Ramana Maharshi says, <laughs> they say to him, you know, well, what's the big thing you learned? And, and how, how many times, John, did we hear this from Master Stanley and Hammond Bay? It's all one. It's all one thing. So anyway, we can keep that running and just for the heck of it. Um, and it's more fascinating than I am, I think. So, so here's the, the, the big challenge is how do we, in fact, here, here we're backing out again now. And you can go back, you know, this is now. And keep in mind, this is 1.5%. And it's like looking at a slide from, from a brain, right? You're just looking at a little tiny bit of tissue, basically. Cool. Thank you. Um, so what do we do with this? The, the cat is walking me through this sense after sense after sense to the point where I am just totally connected now to this world that I'm looking at. I can see it, I can hear it, I can feel it. You just feel the wind on your face, feel the, the weight of your butt on the chair. You know, there's gravity, the earth is holding us here. And I'm just completely there. And then he leans across the table like he's going to tell me some incredible secret. And he said, there's something you need to know. What's that? And he says, and as he says this, I'm looking at all this stuff. And he says, it's, and he's whispering, loud stage whispers. He says, it's all alive. And in that moment, I saw that it was all alive. I mean, even the stuff that looks like it's inanimate, it's all vibrating with the fire of life. It's all part of creation. It's all alive. And it washed through me all the way down to my feet. I felt like the, every barrier vanished. And, you know, I spent the next 15 years trying to recreate that, <laughs> that experience, you know, because it was a little enlightenment moment. It was so powerful. I am convinced that, 
I started out talking about Rene Descartes and the Cartesian worldview and how the Cartesian worldview has not served us well. The idea that the universe is a machine, that the world is a machine, that the atmosphere is a machine. If we can just figure out which levers to pull, we can solve all problems. You know. It's not a machine. It's a living thing. The planet is a living thing. And so I, I personally believe that the biggest, and this is going to be part of the focus of the fourth video, which will be out in a couple of weeks. I personally believe that the, uh, the biggest challenge we face, and maybe even the easiest one, <coughs> is to change people's consciousness about what's real. To, to cause people to wake up to the fact that it's all a lie. The, uh, the biggest challenge we face, and maybe even the easiest one, <coughs> is to change people's con Our bodies think that cesium is potassium, so, and potassium is the essential ingredient of all of our muscles. So we absorb cesium, and it goes into our muscles, and this is why it's, it's all alive. You're alive, I'm alive, we're here right now in this moment, surrounded by life in a universe that's alive. It's all alive. If it's all alive, how can we continue to throw poison into it? That's crazy. I mean, six, we've had five mass extinctions on this planet. Every single one was, was caused by carbon underground being removed from underground and thrown into the atmosphere. The Permian mass extinction, it was volcanic eruptions. Out of the five, five mass extinctions, four of them were volcano driven, where, where continents were tearing apart, moving around, things like that. And what it did is it heated up the oceans enough that all that methane got bubbled up into the atmosphere, and boom, you had an extinction event, and everything died. And, and everything got rebooted. The one exception to that that wasn't driven by, by uh, volcanoes was the, the one that killed the dinosaurs, which was caused by the asteroid hit. But the asteroid hit stirred up all the methane, right? Same thing. So this is methane bomb. It's like five billion tons of methane sitting at the bottom of the oceans that if the oceans warm up just one or two degrees, it goes off. And nothing's left for a million years. And we can do something to prevent that from happening. But I think, I really think that you know, running around saying, oh my God, oh my God, we're all going to die, is not the way to do it. I think the way to do it is to point out that it's all alive, that we're part of this. This is, this is what the New Caledonians had figured out that the Maoris hadn't figured out. This is what the Iroquois had figured out that the, that the European settlers didn't figure out. In fact, Ben Franklin, when he, he uh, he invited 34 Iroquois elders to come to the Constitutional Convention, bless it, on the opening day, and they stayed there for five days, sleeping in the second floor of, of Independence Hall in Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh. And, and Franklin gave the opening speech where he introduced them to the delegates. And this was entirely, this language sounds harsh, but it was, it, 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 back in 1787, this was actually considered a flattery. This was praise for the Native Americans. He said, um, it should be, he said, it should be an extraordinary thing if five nations of ignorant savages have been able to forge a bond which has lasted in peace for a thousand years, and 13 colonies of educated Englishmen can't do the same. <laughs> <laughs> and what Abigail Adams knew, John Adams' wife, John Adams was one of the delegates to the convention, what Abigail Adams knew was that four of the five Iroquois nations did let men vote. So she sent a letter to John saying, don't forget the ladies. And John said, you can find all this stuff. It's easily found online and whatnot. Uh, and John sent a letter back to Abigail. She was up in Braintree, Mass. He was in Pittsburgh. He sent a letter back to her saying, uh, count on it, but we will not forget our male prerogatives. <laughs> so she sent him back a letter saying, if you don't give women the full rights of men, we, I, I will lead a rebellion. We are, we are determined to foist a rebellion, to foment a rebellion. And he ignored her. And here we are. But anyway, I, I am, I'm part of digression, but I, I, just, I just find the whole thing fascinating that, that 
human beings repeatedly, and you find this story with virtually every Aboriginal society, every Native Indigenous society, they hit a wall over and over and over again. The Iroquois did, the, the, the uh, Pueblo people did, the uh, you, you, tribe after tribe. Peter, Peter Farb documented this in a book called Man's Rise of Civilization in the American Indian back in the 60s. And, um, and in fact, this is one of the criticisms is, that's lobbied or that's thrown by right-wingers by and large against people who try to hold up you know, uh, Seneca talking about you know, the importance of preserving the pristine nature. And they say, oh yeah, but the, you know, the, the Indians didn't do that. They wiped out the three-toed sloth because it was easy to kill. They wiped out the, the woolly mammoths. They wiped out the saber-toothed tigers. They wiped, you know, they killed off all these big animals, um, you know, because they were hungry. And they created extinctions. And sure enough, you know, the Clovis people, 12,000 years ago, they, they wiped out all these animals. And then they hit a wall. And they said, OK, we've got to figure out how to live in a sustainable fashion. We can't do this anymore. And, and the way that they, virtually without exception, all around the world, the way that these Aboriginal societies figured out how to live in balance was by sacralizing the world, by saying, it must be that everything around us has a place, everything around us has consciousness. Everything around us is part of everything that is, and we're going to be part of everything that's around us. We're going to interact with this in a really good and healthy way. And that's our work. Or at least that's part of our work. That's my work. Part of my work is to re-sacralize the world, is to awaken people to the fact that it's all, it's all one, it's all sacred. And, and from that, then everything else, you know, how we treat our kids, how we treat each other, how we do our society, how we deal with criminals, how we deal with, with uh, you know, societal problems, society's problems, how we educate, how we, how we conduct business, how we do our politics, everything else flows out of that. Because when the fundamental question is what's in the best interest of the seventh generation from now, which is in the Iroquois Confederacy's, Confederacy's constitution, every decision has to be made in the context of how it's going to affect the seventh generation. When that becomes the, the frame, then decisions are made very differently. So um, I've learned a lot from the Coptics over the years. I'm a, a, a Master Stanley and Hammond Bay changed my life tremendously. And John Davis changed my life tremendously. And I've learned a lot from John and from, from Master Stanley and from Hammond Bay. And, and this is a piece of it and how I'm working to reach my capstone and reach for yourself. And, and how you can too. So uh, the, the good news is that this is something that we can do. I'm, we absolutely can do. So on that, thank you very much for showing up. If anybody has a question, I'd be glad to. Yeah, sure. yeah. Fukushima. Fukushima, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's my opinion that, and I have not heard this from anyone, et cetera, but I've been anti-nuclear for years. But um, So um, I've learned a lot from the Coptics over the years. I'm at, at, at Master Stanley and Hammond Bay changed our bodies think that cesium is potassium. So, and potassium is the essential ingredient of all of our muscles. So we absorb cesium and it goes into our muscles. And this is why there's this condition around Chernobyl called Chernobyl Heart, where all these uh, young people, old people, all across, they just, the holes are burned in their heart because the heart is the most rapidly growing, constantly renewing muscle in the whole body. And so it takes enormous amounts of potassium. In fact, people with heart disease are typically put on potassium supplements. We're told to eat things that are high in potassium, like coconut juice. And Everybody thinks it's bananas. Bananas are actually fairly low in potassium contained compared to a lot of other things. So what happens is that the fish eat the, 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 the plankton absorbs the cesium, thinking it's potassium. Then the little fish eat the plankton. Then the medium-sized fish eat the little fish. And then the big fish eat the little fish, the medium size. And by the time you've got it into a blue fish tuna, you can run a Geiger counter by it and have it go Brrr! It's called bioconcentration. And that's the real danger. That's, I, you know, I, I have three kids who live in Portland, Oregon, and I've had 
thank God they're all vegetarians, because you know, <laughs> uh, if, if I was eating fish and I was looking at, you know, the, 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 my first question would be, is this Atlantic or Pacific? Because they are fairly separate bodies of water. And Pacific fish right now, I would not go near, personally. It's just, you know, and I don't have, I can't point to any specific science about that. Um, one of the reasons is that our government has stopped monitoring these things in the, in the wake of Fukushima. This is how we responded to it. Like that, right? So. The, the, uh, I'm wondering if Fukushima is also going to be affecting this, uh, uh, yeah, down in the bottom of the ocean. Oh, the methane, methane, methane hydrates, yeah, methane yeah, methane because the currents are bringing right. the radioactivity up, they're venting st the heat, and it's not only the radioactivity, it's the heat of right. the stuff that they're doing. Right. Isn't that? It probably won't have any effect on it because the, the radioactive material, we're now measuring off the west coast of the United States, cesium-134 and 137 from Fukushima. The, the radioactive, the, they're called actinides, the transuranic elements, they're showing up here. Yeah. But they're in, they're, they're in a concentration of six becquerels per cubic meter of water, which is, you've got this much water, and six times a second you hear a click on a guy, that's not much, it's very, very dilute. It's not enough to heat the methane. What it is enough to do is because the body thinks, all bodies, our bodies, fishes' bodies, all bodies, think that cesium is potassium. Cesium is next to potassium on the periodic table. There's this condition around Chernobyl called Chernobyl heart, where all these uh, young people, old people, all across, they just, the holes are burned in their heart because the heart is the most rapidly growing, constantly renewing muscle in the whole body. And so it takes enormous amounts of potassium. In fact, people with heart disease are typically put on potassium supplements. We're told to eat things that are high in potassium, like coconut juice. And everybody thinks it's bananas. Bananas are actually fairly low in potassium contained compared to a lot of other things. So what happens is that the fish eat the, 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 the plankton absorbs the cesium, thinking it's potassium. Then the little fish eat the plankton. Then the medium-sized fish eat the little fish. And then the big fish eat the little fish, the medium size. And by the time you've got it into a blue fish tuna, you can run a Geiger counter by it and have it go brrrr. It's called bioconcentration. And that's the real uh, danger. That's, I, you know, I, I have three kids who live in Portland, Oregon. And, I'm, and thank God they're all vegetarians, because you know, <laughs> uh, if, if I was eating fish and I was looking at you know, the, 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 my first question would be, is this Atlantic or Pacific? Because they are fairly separate bodies of water. And Pacific fish right now, I would not go near, personally. It's just, you know, and I don't have, I can't point to any specific science about that. Um, one of the reasons is that our government has stopped monitoring these things in the, in the wake of Fukushima. This is how we responded to it, uh, like that, right? So, yes, sir. Do you have any uh, thoughts about how many people with advanced consciousness are required to create the critical mass? I don't. I know uh, Herr Mueller's mentor from Poyak, who is a Hasidic Jew, taught him that the ancient Talmudic teachings said that there are 34 awakened souls on earth at any time, and they hold the world together. And that if several of them were to die and not be replaced, the world would be at risk. That was one of the things that a lot of Orthodox Jews were freaked out about with regard to the Holocaust. Um, and who knows? But I think it's a lot more than 34 people to, to, to alter everything. But on the other hand, I would not underestimate the power of the light. Where do you think music stands in the whole world of things? Music? Music. Music is a way of uh, organizing our brain. It's a way of activating your brain that can open things tremendously. Excuse me. The more we open to love, the more that we open to compassion, the more that, you know, music can do that. The music can do the opposite, too. The horse special song, you know, the Nazi marching song, yeah. not a good one. Um, but uh, generally speaking, I think you know, music is just a tool. It's like anything else. You know, music for better. Yes, sir. Just a, a previous question. I'm a Santa, and in talking with other Santas, 
our experiences are common, and that about uh, roughly 50% of the children that we now see are coming in with this advanced DNA, more than 20 active codons, which means they have indigo and or crystal energy. Right. And, and with the, the rate they're coming in now, when they hit positions of power, the Earth cannot stay the same. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that our species is evolving in response to the challenges that we have created for ourselves. Um, I can't document that, but and and I mean, a simple way to say that would be that we are we are biologically altered. We have become biologically and neurologically altered in response to the poisons that we put in our own environment. And you can call that a disability, or you can call that an evolutionary leap forward. Um, which is a whole other topic that I've written several books about. But yeah, yeah, I would do. So thank you all for showing up tonight. And please check out the Cockhead Center. Tell your friends, get them down. Thank you.